Look at this. It's a creature whose entire evolutionary strategy is being brave. But how did it get here, and where will it go? So, the first thing to note is that, in previous versions of our simulation, each tile could support any number of creatures. But this is a bit silly, because things need space. So let's limit that. Each tile already has a maximum plant biomass value based on its biome. So, a tile that's been categorized as rainforest will have a greater max plant biomass value than one that's been categorized as desert. And we can use this value to determine the amount of space that's available for creatures. If that's not intuitive, think about it this way. A desert is basically a single surface, and animals can walk around on that surface. A rainforest has the same area, but it also has vertical space that can be filled with creatures that may never set foot on the ground. And just note that when we talk about space, we aren't talking about the physical space taken up by a creature's body. We're talking about the amount of space that must be available in an environment to support that creature. So, these are the numbers for this simulation. But now that space is limited, what happens when too many creatures enter the same area? Once a tile reaches its capacity, creatures will start bumping into each other and attempting to push each other out. The way this works under the hood is pretty simple. The creatures are added to a pair of lists, with each row being a potential conflict. For each potential conflict, the system checks whether the creatures notice each other using their stealth, perception, and size. If they do, then the potential conflict becomes a fight over territory. Now, in the real world, creatures don't typically go out looking for fights. The goal is to survive, and even relatively minor injuries can be a death sentence in the wild. So, often, a winner will be determined before any notable fighting takes place. This is why you, a human, can scare away a black bear even though you have a 0% chance of winning that fight. Now, creatures deal with this in a ton of different ways, but we're going to keep it as simple as possible. When there's a fight over territory, creatures will attempt to bully their opponent. Bullying takes account of two new stats, Intimidation and Courage. The Intimidation of Creature 1 is combined with the Courage of Creature 2, and then the system rolls to see who wins. If the bully wins, the loser runs to another tile. If the bully loses, the tables turn and we start over. If the new bully also loses, in other words, neither creature is willing to back down, the creatures will fight to the death with the winner taking both the territory and a meal, assuming they consume meat. Now, I just want to point out that these are two very special stats. Other stats will have a direct effect on some number. For example, when speed increases, there's a direct impact on the amount of energy a creature consumes. Similarly, when stealth increases, this directly impacts a creature's ability to move between tiles. However, for courage and intimidation, the cost-benefit is entirely determined by behavior. Higher courage has the benefit of making a creature less susceptible to bullying, but it increases the odds that a creature will end up in a fight to the death. Higher intimidation decreases the chance of engaging in a fight. And to be honest, I struggle to think of a disbenefit here. After all, it seems like winning a fight without risking death would always be a good thing. But it's important to remember that winning is not really a useful term here. It's much better to ask what are the outcomes rather than who wins. When one creature successfully intimidates another, the outcomes are a fight is avoided and the bullied creature flees to a new tile. But who's actually in the better position here? Both creatures avoided a fight, so that cancels out. So the only outcome is this. But what if this is a better tile? After all, the reason this creature got bullied in the first place is because this tile was overcrowded. So there's a reasonable chance that the loser ended up in a better position. That said, there's certainly no guarantee. There's a lot of dangerous tiles out there, and if this one is overpopulated, it's probably pretty good. So we have a good argument for both low and high intimidation being optimal strategies. But there's just one more thing to consider. Because our creatures are fighting over territory, they got one more stat. Territory. Whichever tile a creature is born on becomes its home tile, and a creature's territory rating determines how far it can wander from that tile. At a starting value of 100, a creature's range would be about this far. The only other thing to note is that if a creature is bullied away from their home tile, then whatever tile they land on becomes their new home. So, let's see what happens. If we speed forward, say, 60,000 turns, you'll notice these bubbles, which were added because a few of you rightly pointed out that it was difficult to follow what was going on over the map. So I thought I'd try and rectify that. The color of the bubbles tracks the population in each tile that has at least one creature, with white being high population and dark being low population. The height of the bubbles tracks the average courage on a tile, and the cross section tracks intimidation. I'll keep a legend here for convenience. So, it looks like we already have some variation, with a bit more focus on courage in these regions, and a bit more focus on intimidation here, and a mixture of emphasis in these areas. But one thing I thought was immediately interesting was that we have more variation in small areas, even when they are connected. If you've watched my other videos, you'll know that it was very common for one build to completely take over a region, or even the entire map, so I was quite pleased to see this. I think this was entirely the result of the territory change, which has the added benefit of stopping creatures from randomly running into the desert to die. 
And it's pretty cool because, again, the territory stat actually has no direct impact on any other stat at all. Its impact is entirely based on behavior. Anyway, from here things started to stabilize, but it's worth noting that nothing was able to establish a presence outside areas of tropical rainforest, at least for now. Around turn 189,000, these creatures got pretty close, but couldn't quite make it work. And in the early 200s, there was an attempt up here, and you'll notice a few more along the way. We'll keep an eye on that, but for now I want to stay focused on courage and intimidation. The strategies enabled by these stats can be broken into four broad categories. High intimidation and low courage. With this strategy, you try and scare away your opponent or otherwise flee. This minimizes the likelihood of a conflict, but still attempts to defend your territory. High courage with low intimidation. With this strategy, you actually avoid scaring others, and you ensure you're not scared away yourself. This maximizes the likelihood of conflict. Low intimidation and low courage. This is a low conflict strategy that maximizes the chance that you'll move to a new tile. High intimidation and high courage. With this strategy, you either scare your opponent away or you fight. It maximizes your chance of keeping a tile. And of course, there's any number of strategies in between. So what do you think will happen? My original prediction was that intimidation would, in general, emerge as a dominant factor. There were two reasons for this. It doesn't cost very much, and it gives creatures a way to win fights without risking death. But let's see how we get on. You're going to see that both of our major populations trend towards courage early, although the east is a little more extreme even though it had high intimidation for a short period. And by the time we get to turn 488,000, things look a bit different. The east has found a new dominant build, and the west is trying out something similar with both sides testing some more unique builds as well. Interestingly, there hasn't yet been any interchange between these populations, so it's an example of convergent evolution. However, not long after this, around turn 550,000, you're gonna see a quick burst of creatures successfully colonizing our savanna biome, and this is the start of a new age. As our creatures move towards a single connected world, we see a lot of coexisting variation, so let's stop and take a bird's eye view. Intimidation has generally been pretty low, Courage has generally been pretty high, and territories have remained pretty small on the whole. And while we're here, I'll just note that I'm not going to go through every stat in every video anymore, because I just can't get through it all. The plan is to start releasing data to my patrons, including raw video footage, which in this case would run for around 24 hours. But note that this isn't access to the simulation itself, because honestly, it just isn't ready. But if you want to play with some data and share your results, please feel free. Anyway, let's take a look at our savanna creatures. This is quite a special moment to me because it hadn't really existed in any previous sim. The closest we've been is here, when creatures were successfully able to traverse savannah, but only on the way from one tropical region to another. There may have been a few reasons for the success of savannah creatures this time, but I think the main one is pretty obvious. And also I think the addition of territories has prevented creatures from becoming too spread out in these more sparse regions. If we look a little deeper, we can see that this group has leaned heavily into grass, with a 90% affinity for it. And this one has diversified a little bit more, with only 50% affinity. So we don't need a complete grazer to survive in the savanna biome. And if we look a little bit closer at some of the other stats for our savanna populations, say from turn 577,000, and compare them to our rainforest populations, we can see that nothing is really unique here. So I'm not going to look much deeper into this, I really think territories and grass are the reasons we have success. Over time, our western creatures lean into both courage and intimidation, while our eastern creatures ignore intimidation altogether and this population in particular has really started to focus on courage. It's notable that the scare or flee option seems to have been absent most of the time. This was surprising to me because, as I said, there's no direct cost to intimidation and having lower courage reduces the chance of a creature being killed. That said, I can think of a couple potential factors here. First, the map has been consistently dominated by omnivores, so perhaps lowering a creature's chance of fighting will just lower its chance of getting a meal. Second, and more convincing in my eyes, the creatures have evolved to be very, very slow. What this means is that, when a creature gets pushed out of a tile, it takes a long time to get to a new tile. And when it gets there, there's no guarantee that the tile it finds will be suitable. Now, remember that creatures can't eat while traveling, so being slow greatly increases the risk associated with leaving a tile, and, by proxy, this increases the value of being courageous. But let's see how we progress from here. Closing in on turn 723,000, we get to the most extreme builds I've ever seen in one of these sims. Let's try and work out what caused our creature to forego everything in favor of courage. The first thing to note is that we don't have any really strong correlations with other stats. There's possibly something here with intimidation, but over here we have the opposite. 
It's a bit of a lesson in accepting stats at face value because if I just showed you this much of the chart, then it would look an awful lot like intimidation and courage are directly linked. And while we're on that subject, you should check out Brilliant.org, a free and easy way to learn computer science, math, and data science. I'm currently loving Brilliant's logic series, which walks you through a bunch of puzzles you need to solve using, uh, logic. It's fun, and you actually learn why puzzles work the way they do. Understanding logic is super important in pretty much every scenario, and I really think the world would be a better place if everyone spent some time learning the key principles of logical thinking. There's thousands of lessons from beginner to advanced, and Brilliant customizes content to fit your needs, so check it out. If you want to try for free for 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash 8littlebears, or click the link below. The first 200 people to sign up using my link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So, moving on with our little avatar of courage, let's look at diets. Average meat consumption has declined, which is a little odd given that being highly courageous increases the chance of a fight which could result in meat. Focusing on the snapshot from turn 723,000, we can see that the average trend does suggest that there is some level of positive correlation between courage and a meat-based diet. That said, there are numerous exceptions to this, so I don't think it's all that strong. And this was really the story for all of the hard data points I looked at. It may be that there's some specific combination that's insightful, but I didn't find it. So what if we look elsewhere? In particular, I want to look at geography. All of our highest courage creatures are grouped here, and the other high courage creatures are in these regions. Now, what you may have noticed about these regions is that they're all semi-isolated. They're also population dense and relatively small. So the potential conclusion we can draw from this is that when space is short, courage is key. It's worth fighting to keep your spot, even if the potential outcome is death. To test this, let's review the progression of courage over time. If this conclusion holds, we should see consistently more courage in these areas than anywhere else on the map. To me, this looks pretty convincing. We have some variation, of course, but overall it looks like courage is a higher priority stat in these areas. But what do you think? Anyway, the simulation is not yet over, so let's see where things go from here. Around turn 750,000, the global population began to dramatically increase, but this increase in population came with a decrease in stability, with fluctuations of 30-50% to 50 being relatively common. From around turn 800,000, things really began to break down. Our savannah population was the first to fall, followed by our western population. And then finally, our eastern population starts to crumble. Around turn 900,000, the global population dropped to below 100 for the first time, and it even went below 50 at one point, with the last remnants of our once bustling world being here, possibly descended from our avatars of courage. And then they start to spread, taking over an empty and forgotten world. I wasn't able to determine the cause of this extinction. For example, there was no significant change in the causes of death over time. We saw a rise in both predation and territory disputes, but these more or less just mirrored the rise in population. One notably weak but interesting point is that it looks like the population started to die here, but was revived by something. And if we break down the populations to herbivores, carnivores, and omnivores, we can see that this revival was almost perfectly aligned with the point of equilibrium between these three diet types. Then, at the peak, herbivores die and we lose equilibrium, and the population plummets. And the inference we can draw from this is that, once a population gets to a certain size, it needs a significant population of herbivores to maintain that size. But, I don't know, the evidence is pretty sketchy. It's pretty much a conspiracy theory at this point, which means it should be treated as fact, and I dare anyone, anyone at all, to challenge this because, honestly, it kind of looks like what I said. But who knows, maybe one of you can find something better. Anyway, thanks to all my patrons and YouTube members, especially these nice folks, and Ruben, Anacon the Wolf of Shadows, and Possum in particular. If you have the means to do so, and you want to support my work, or even contribute your own analysis, links are in the pinned comment and description below. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.